Hello, my name is Richard Harrison and I'm the founder of Canford Publishing. Um, today I want to talk to you about critical thinking and look at the ways, the different ways we can introduce it into the language classroom. But I want to start off by making a few general points about critical thinking. Um, so what is it exactly? Well, it's one of the 21st century skills, those skills that we need in the age of the internet. And it is generally accepted there are 12 of these. I'll look at those in a bit more detail in a moment. It's a type of thinking along with everyday thinking, scientific thinking, creative thinking, and so on. Everyday thinking is the um, common type of thinking that we engage in every day when random thoughts drift into our heads um, unexpectedly. Um, critical thinking is not like that. It's not random at all. It's very conscious thinking. It's also voluntary and it's reflective, meaning that it involves deep thinking over a period of time. And it's also reasonable. It's based on reason. We use reason to decide what to do or what to believe. Another point, it's an, an integral part of academic life. So everything that a student does at university or college or school for that matter, involves critical thinking. So if they're reading, writing an essay, uh, reading a textbook, looking at data, critical thinking is involved. Of course, it's not always taught explicitly. It's often assumed that students pick this up along the way. But I would argue that it definitely needs to be taught explicitly. Um, another point, a final point I'd like to make, it encourages skepticism and doubt. Now, I think these are good things, they're positive. It's not the same as being negative about things and cynical about the world. Um, it's, it's good because they lead to asking questions. And really asking questions is the core of critical thinking. Um, asking questions to perhaps challenge the conventional wisdom. So not just factual questions, but questions might, which that might be difficult or probing, searching, and so on, awkward, inconvenient, even in the past, dangerous questions. And it's by challenging the conventional wisdom that knowledge has expanded throughout history. People have uh, challenged the conventional view of for example, the, the, the earth, is the earth flat? Is the earth the, really the center of the universe? And through this, knowledge has expanded in all of these areas. So how can we introduce critical thinking into our programs, our language programs in particular? <clears throat> I like to use this image of the diamond because uh, I think it represents the type of thinking that we want our students to engage in. Um, let me give you some adjectives. Diamond, diamonds are precise, they're sharp, they're incisive, they're sparkling, they're clear. So this is the type of thinking that we should be aiming for. As opposed to this kind of thinking, which we can call woolly thinking, and this is probably what we do most of the time. We um, have unfocused thinking, sloppy thinking, even muddled or lazy thinking. So how do we go from that to, to the diamond, to the sharp, precise type of thinking that we're aiming for? Well, I've got three suggestions here, three different approaches, which can be uh, alternatives or they can be used uh, together. 
Um, first of all, get students to think about their thinking, which is metacognition. And I'll speak about this in a moment. Um, introduce a critical thinking syllabus into the course. So alongside the other elements of your program, with your foundation program, for example, um, make space for a critical thinking syllabus. Or a more flexible approach, introduce critical thinking activities into the language classroom. And I say flexible because these can be five minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes, and it doesn't need uh, reorganization of the existing program. So let's start with thinking about thinking. And in this illustration, um, a man is looking at himself, he's watching himself, he's sort of stepping outside his body. And I think this is what we need to do when it comes to thinking about thinking. I've taken this illustration from um, my book, uh, Framework First, by the way. Uh, so thinking about thinking is an important thinking skill. It includes noticing the way we learn or perform a task, knowing ourselves, knowing what we are good at and what we need to improve, and planning what we need to do to complete a particular task or to solve a problem. So all of that involves um, thinking about our thinking processes. How do we actually go about um, encouraging this, practicing it? Well, have a look at this task here. Uh, think about a big decision you had to make recently, a new job, a new home, ending a friendship or a relationship. So this task can be done in twos and threes. It's really a discussion. And here is uh, not so much a worksheet, but a kind of a guidelines a for a structured discussion. What issue did you need to decide about? What steps did you go through before you made your decision? How could you improve your decision making process? So we could come up with a lot of tasks like this that focus on decision making, problem solving, and so on making students aware of their own thinking processes. Now let's move on to the critical thinking syllabus. And I think of critical thinking as a, a bundle of skills. It's not just one skill, rather like uh, reading is a bundle of skills or writing or speaking or listening. They can be broken down into sub skills and this can form the basis of your syllabus. So <clears throat> under the heading of arguments and opinions, building strong arguments, looking at both sides of an argument, supporting an opinion. Now, when I taught at uh, the German University in Oman, uh, my students were full of opinions. They had lots of opinions. Uh, but they were not so good at expressing them or giving evidence or reasons or support or sources. They weren't good at supporting their uh, opinions. They relied very much on emotion and exaggeration. Uh, another important point here is defining terms. So if we're having a discussion about poverty, for example, or democracy, or happiness, or uh, success, or, or any subject like that, we need to know exactly what we mean by that particular term. And we need to know for our own benefit, our own thinking process, and also for the reader and the listener. So poverty, for example, we could use the United Nations uh, definition of extreme poverty, um, an income of $2 a day or less. Now let's go on to data, another important area of critical thinking, commenting on data, asking questions about data, 
linking cause and effect and avoiding false correlations. So just because two events um, happen at the same time doesn't mean to say that there's a causal relationship between those two. So we need to, to watch out for that. Uh, problem solutions. So first of all, of course, identifying a problem, defining it, and then finding, um, evaluating solutions, and then using criteria to make a choice. So for example, if the problem is that we, uh, we need to replace a car, get another car, um, we might use the criteria of, for example, um, the, the price of the car, the fuel economy, the safety record, the, the comfort, the, the color. And we would put these different criteria in a ranking and decide which is the most important in that ranking. So that's the way that we make an intelligent choice uh, rather than just going with our instinct or our hearts. Um, now, I mentioned the 21st century skills earlier, and I said there are 12. <clears throat> um, and here they've been put into a, a classification. And actually taking items, uh, any items, and deciding what they have in common, and then putting them into groups, and then putting those groups into a kind of classification, this is in fact a critical thinking skill. So that's one of the other elements of critical thinking. Uh, analyzing a process or a procedure. So for example, um, the process of manufacturing tea, uh, complex process, but if we break it down into a lot of little steps, it became, becomes easier to understand and easier to explain to, to the reader or to the listener. And the same with a procedure, like, for example, if you want to send a parcel from your country to another country, what are the steps involved in doing that? Or the steps involved in writing a dissertation? Um, distinguishing fact and opinion, an important uh, critical thinking skill. And thinking about thinking we've already um, mentioned. So these are some of the elements that we might decide to put into our critical thinking syllabus for our course. Um, this is what I did when I wrote my book uh, framework, the first one I did on critical thinking and academic writing. So here is the critical thinking strand or component of the course. And it's alongside the writing skills component and the language focus. And it's divided into uh, a number of different sub skills. Okay, let's go on now to the classroom activities. Remember, this is the flexible approach where we can take these activities for five, 10, 20 minutes or whatever, and feed them in to our existing program. And there are a number of activities here. I'm sure you're familiar with most of these. But alongside, I've put in the skills that I think these are practicing. So for example, puzzles, word puzzles, riddles, and so on, are in fact training the brain. Because we, the more we do these puzzles, the better we become at them. The same with linguistic texts, jumble texts. Uh, which in fact are just linguistic puzzles. So they train the linguistic brain. They actually teach students to look out for grammar, uh, semantic, uh, syntax, and discourse features as well when they try to reorganize a text. Um, brainstorming, uh, creative thinking. Class debates are very uh, useful for building strong arguments. So we divide the class into teams on a particular topic, maybe for and against, and they come up with arguments based on reasons and evidence and so on. 
to support their case, and then they debate it. So it's a very good activity. And structured discussion, self-reflection tasks. Here are a few more. Uh, <clears throat> quizzes, I think they're very useful for um, teaching students to not accept what they think they already know, to make them go back to the data, to go back to the facts. Otherwise, they are guilty of lazy thinking. I think we all think that. We, we think we know certain things about the world, and then we're surprised when we're presented with the actual facts. So a well-crafted quiz can, can uh, work on that and, and teach uh, students to be uh, to be to beware of of lazy thinking. Now the ones in blue here, I'm going to look at in a bit more detail. Give some examples. So scam emails, advertisements, misleading data, and scientific experiments. So probably like me, you get a lot of. Um, emails in your inbox and a lot of them are scam emails and you get irritated maybe not as annoyed as this person here but um, you get irritated sometimes amused and you click delete but then I started to think well wait a minute let's turn this around maybe we can find something useful in these emails and in fact in that uh, the few seconds that you spend looking at it, reading, making a judgment, and then pressing delete, that is actually an example of critical thinking in practice. So this is actually a very rich source of critical thinking, and we can make use of it. Let's uh, look at this example here. Now, this is one I received that's supposed to be from PayPal. And, but the things I put in red are things that triggered a warning, um, made me suspicious. So for example, dear customer, well, it's a general email. It's not to me specifically, no account reference, um, some odd language, alert activity. Uh, and then there's a grammatical mistake. We need to confirmation. Well, you start to think, would. PayPal, a big company like that, really send out emails with grammatical mistakes in? I don't think so. And you could argue that you need a, a definite article here before problem and before uh, resolution center. So what do, the, what do they want you to do? They want you to click on these links. So again, using my critical thinking, I decided I probably wouldn't take the chance. I, did, I, I didn't click on those links. Now, how can we exploit this? Um, I've come up with a worksheet here. Um, what does the sender want you to do? By the way, this can be used across the board, I think, with any scam email, but you might want to um, do a more sophisticated worksheet that focuses on a particular uh, email. So what does the sender want you to do? They might want you to click on a link uh, to reply to their email or to send some personal details or even to send money. Why are you suspicious? Well, I've given you an example now of why I was suspicious about that last one. Here's one more. On the surface, it looks a little bit more genuine. Um, this company actually exists. I checked it out and that's their address. But um, I started to think, well, wait a minute. Uh, why are they using their personal email and a private email and a private telephone number? And then hello, addressing me as hello, not by name. And he's got this proposal, very generous proposal, as you read on, but he doesn't even know who I am. So all of this is extremely suspicious. And of course, it's a very generous offer. It seems too good to be true. <clears throat> and we know that if things seem too good to be true, 
they usually are too good to be true. Um, other things, um, the language is a bit odd here. During the Eastern city of Benghazi insurgency, there's a mistake. If you look to sharp eyes, there's a mistake in the number here because there should be a comma after 300. And there's also some other strange language here. Um, sharing shall be fair enough, and then a capital F of five. So all of that makes me suspicious and makes me want to delete the email and not um, accept the invitation. So there are many uh, emails. Some of them are more sophisticated than these and they require a lot more thought. But I think it's a very rich source of critical thinking and something that we should make use of. Right, um, now then, also a very rich source, I think, of critical thinking are advertisements. And why it, advertisements? What is it about advertisements that are so uh, interesting for us? Well, advertisements are, by their nature, very subjective. They're full of emotion, exaggeration, uh, misleading claims. They're not very good with evidence, in fact, very little evidence, and sometimes they're not truthful at all. So all of this is the opposite of, of what we're trying to teach our students in the academic world, where you are meant to be objective, you don't use emotion, you provide evidence, and of course you're, you are truthful as well. And we can also have a, a lot of fun with these advertisements as well. Um, look at this one, for example. They invite lots and lots of questions. So, for example, in this case, you might say, well, is this really the same person, the one on the left and the one on the right? Um, and how many minutes um, do you have to apply the cream for in order to get this effect? Or how many minutes over how many days, weeks, months? Um, what is the evidence for this claim? Where is it? And so on. Uh, there's a grammatical error, by the way. It should be fewer wrinkles. But so it invites lots of questions. And how do we exploit this? Well, as before, I've uh, done a worksheet which can apply to any advertisement. But again, you might want to do something more specific. What claim is the advertiser making? Well, they are always making a claim, so it's important to look at the claim. And then think of, think of three critical questions, for example, three. Um, you could ask the advertisers. Right, and here, as I say, you can have a lot of fun with them. Look at this one. Uh, it's a rather old advertisement. Um, and according to this, a lot of doctors say that these cigarettes are less irritating and they protect your throat against irritation, against coughs and so on. And they've even got a, a doctor, a picture of a doctor. But of course, we know this isn't a doctor. We know it's a drawing. So a lot of questions are invited by this advertisement. Uh, here's a more modern one, Duracell and the batteries last even longer. Well, what does that mean? Longer than what? Longer than the old Duracell batteries or longer than their competitors? Um, and where are the results? What evidence is there that they last longer? How do we know this? And so on. Um, here's one more that claims that 7up is very good for babies. I'm not sure it is. Um, and if you read in the text there, they make some other claims. And finally, just to show you one more, those <clears throat> sales advertisements are all over the place. And we have to be careful with sales because uh, they can distort. Look at this, up to 50%. So first of all, you notice 50%. You think, oh, well, that's good. Everything half price. But up to, of course, means that only a few items will be 
at, at half price, and the others might be 10% or 20% or 30%. Right, let's move on to um, another area, misleading data. And by misleading, I mean data that is inaccurate sometimes or incomplete. Uh, it involves cherry picking. Cherry picking means when the uh, when somebody takes the data that supports their point of view and ignores the other data. So this is something that has to be looked out for. Lacking in context, I'll show you an example of that in a moment, or it might just be untruthful. Now we've got an awful lot of data around at the moment because of um, COVID-19. And I don't really like to introduce this subject because I'm sure we've all had an, more than enough of it, but it is a very rich source of data. And a lot of it is misleading, some of it may be inaccurate, uh, a lot is taken out of context. So let's just have a look at a couple of examples here. So first of all, COVID cases by country, um, so these are the total numbers of cases um, ranked by country. So we see, well, the United States not doing very well there, right at the top of the list. And Austria, for example, is pretty low down. But of course, we know that countries are all different sizes. Some have huge populations, some have small populations. So you would need to take into account if you're going to make any proper assessment, you need to take into account the size of the country. So over here, that's what's happened. Um, and we see that the United States is actually uh, not doing so badly compared with the other diagram. And Austria, in fact, is doing a little bit worse than, than the United States. Uh, these are old figures, by the way. But I'm just making the point that um, the way we represent the data can um, distort the, the true picture. Here's another example of context. So um, these are recent figures in the UK for deaths in the so-called um, second wave. Um, so from the 15th of September, up to the 10th of November, we can see there's a sharp increase um, and deaths have gone up uh, to around about 400, uh, uh, four to 500 at the moment. So quite alarming, but we should try to view it in the context of the whole year. And if we do that, then we find that, well, it might still be alarming, but not quite as alarming as the situation was in the UK back in March and April. So we find this is done quite a lot, that uh, bits, especially with graphs, that bits of a graph can be taken and used to um, misrepresent. How do we tackle this with a work, uh, worksheet? Well, um, here's one example of what we can do. Again, a pretty general one. What does the data show? What possible problems are there with this data? List them below. So it's really, again, just a vehicle for discussion for students in twos and threes. Finally, let's move on to the scientific method. Now, the scientific method is, the, is, is very central to science, and it is central also to critical thinking. So, and it involves very simply put, um, finding a hypothesis, uh, putting forward a hypothesis, and testing that hypothesis to get a conclusion. So we might start by asking a question by something that we observe in, in nature. Uh, we gather information and, um, and then ob observe. We make a hypothesis, which is basically guessing the answer to our question. Then we carry out an experiment, 
we test the results, uh, sorry, we analyze the results, and then we present our conclusion. Um, so we start off with a question, and here's an example of a question, might be one that you haven't thought of before, and I haven't thought of before. <clears throat> Do mice grow larger if they are given vitamin C? Uh, okay, now ideally we would try to carry out an experiment in the classroom and go through all the steps and stages of it. But of course that's too impractical and takes too much time. But what we can do is to get students to um, think about how they would go about um, testing this um, or finding an answer to this question. So, we would encourage them to think about how they would gather information or make an, a hypothesis, which is basically guessing the answer to the question and then testing the hypothesis with an experiment, what kind of experiment, analyzing the results and then presenting the conclusion. So again, working together in small groups, perhaps this is what they could come up with. So number two here, they would learn about mice, learn about vitamin C, for example. And then they would make a hypothesis. Mice grow larger if they are given vitamin C. <clears throat> and then the experiment, well, I think that's quite straightforward. They would take two groups of mice and perhaps weigh them beforehand. And then one group, they would give um, a, a tasty diet of the things that mice like. And the other group, they would give the same tasty diet, but they would add uh, vitamin C to it. And then they would weigh the dice, uh, the mice at the end of the two weeks. And then present the conclusion. Uh, in case you'd like to know, the hypothesis is not correct. Apparently vitamin C doesn't make any difference to um, to mice. Right, so just coming on to the conclusion, drawing together what I've been saying, um, critical thinking is an important 21st century skill, one of these 12 which I discussed. It's something that can be taught explicitly. Now, as I said, a lot of people think, oh, well, it's picked up along the way during the course of their education. I don't believe this is true, and I really think it needs to be taught explicitly for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Um, it involves um, thinking about uh, thinking. Another approach is that we can use a critical thinking syllabus. And we could also approach it through feeding in classroom activities into an existing program. Or we can use a combination of, of, of this approach, all of these three approaches. Just like to finish up by showing you the two books that I referred to, uh, the two levels of framework, uh, framework first, the lower level, and framework the upper level. They both teach academic writing alongside critical thinking, and also there is discussion and other activities and teacher's guides as well. And if you would like more information about these books, please go to the website. Uh, and if you would like to get in touch with me to ask any questions, uh, please uh, use these email addresses here. So thank you, finally, thank you very much for um, watching the video and uh, I hope you have uh, enjoyed it.